To them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. It's interesting to see how conciliatory Paul gets later on in this letter, uh, telling the Galatians in, in, in chapter 4, Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for you have not injured me at all. Uh, yet we see him not compromising on the truth of the gospel here and its central message of grace. Uh, you know, uh, uh, a really great brother in the Lord said to me one time, uh, uh, he said, you know, I will compromise on just about anything, but I am not going to compromise on the gospel and who Jesus Christ is. Um, and to Paul, as it should, uh, to Paul and this, this great brother I was just mentioning earlier, uh, as it should be to any of us, really, uh, is that we are saved by grace, you know. Uh, and he says this explicitly in chapter two, verse eight of Ephesians: "For by grace are ye saved through faith, and and that not of yourselves; it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast." Uh, this is something, like I said, we should take note of and try and mimic in our own lives. We should be willing to put up with and compromise on uh, just any number of. Of, of unimportant issues, but not on the gospel of grace and who Jesus is. We need to be like Paul in many respects in that as he did not yield on submission even for a moment about the truth of the gospel, you, so as we as well should not yield even for a moment when it comes to the truth of the gospel and grace of Jesus Christ. Uh, and as we'll see in just a few verses, Paul is even willing to split with the other apostles if they depart from the gospel of grace. Amen. Yeah. Uh, that's some good points there. The um, He says, to whom we gave place by subjection, know not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue in you, uh, with you. Uh, J. Vernon McGee has a great one-liner. He says here, no Titus isn't circumcised, and he's not going to be either, is basically how he's on <laughs> that. Uh, but uh, the the conflict here was all about Titus, his circumcision. This is what it was all about. And these false brethren thought that they would have clear grounds to cr create controversy if they could prove it, or I'm not exactly sure what they were wanting to do with it or who they were trying to take it to. But um, we do read here that it was made an example of quite quickly. Paul does not mention here the manner in which he rebuked these men or whether or not it was public or not. But in Luke's description in Acts 15, verses 1 and 2, uh, he does mention it, and it was apparently a big deal. It says, and certain men which which meant, uh, excuse me and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses ye cannot be saved when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them <laughs> they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question so it was sort this this issue that Paul's talking about here in Galatians is is a setup to what later happens when they go up to Jerusalem and uh, and have this uh, council of Jerusalem about the issue. Hmm. Interesting. Good stuff. Yeah, that's it for that one. So. Okay. Verse 6. Oh, wait. Uh, I do have, actually. I just realized there's one okay. more thing. One more. The, the line that says, the truth that the uh, of the gospel might continue with you. And so Paul is going up to this council in Jerusalem and you know making the stand for the gospel for the other Gentiles all around the area. Um, he's, he makes a swift rejection of these false brethren uh, for an example to the Gentile Christians like the Galatians that this early error would not take root. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, since we are talking about here, it's interesting. We're, verse 5 is obviously about not submitting to error, you know, church error. And we had been talking a little bit about that. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3 came to mind. Beloved, believe not every spirit. But try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And, that, and this is that spirit of, of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Um, it's interesting to note here that he says that many false prophets are gone out into the world, and from from my understanding, he he means that like they've already gone out, like they're already out. Um, it's it's just a very I think it's very interesting and sort of germane to our to verse five, mm -hmm. um, verse six, and from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those I say who seemed influential to me added nothing to me. 
this is also an interesting point regarding uh, official office uh, and those who have parents who are well-to-do or high up in the church. God use your heart. So whether you are the president of the United States or a prisoner on death row, God is going to judge you by what's in your heart. Uh, uh, now, if you come and accept the Lord Jesus Christ, he comes and lives in your heart and literally gives you his spirit there in your heart and, and, and makes your heart new. He gives you a new heart and renews – he renews your mind and gives you a new heart. Uh, Romans 12, if you want to check that out. Uh, from the text, it appears that these people were not actually influential in the ways that mattered. Uh, such as an outstanding expositor of the scripture or someone who had a deep and abiding commitment to helping others in the name of Jesus. Uh, it, it appears that, you know, um, besides, you know, besides possibly being Peter, they were doctors, lawyers, public officials, and magistrates, uh, which really don't amount to a hill of beans in God's economy. Uh, people who, who may have been influential in their public lives, but obviously did not have a good grasp on the gospel of grace. Uh, Paul, as we'll see, even includes Peter and some of the other apostles in this group of what they are sometimes called Judaizers, uh, or as he call, as Paul calls them in Philippians, uh, they are of the concision, uh, which is, of course, a play on the word of circumcision, concision meaning to cut oneself or to mutilate oneself badly. Hmm. Uh, well, I would also uh, suggest it seems later when Paul speaks of Peter – He's, he's actually speaking of a sin of Peter in that he knew the truth about the Gentiles, but he was in fear of those that had come down and really just wanted to sort of make it, dress it up and look like, you know, sort of that was his sort of error there, that he did know the truth. Uh, but yeah, you, it, I might not have understood stood that part cor and correctly. But um, in any case, so um, Paul here. Uh, when it says, those seem to be somewhat whatsoever they were, it makes no matter to me. God accepted no man person, for they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Paul is walking a fine line with the Galatians. Uh, one, on one hand, he's saying that he accepts the office of the apostles, he's, and he is showing that the, to the Galatians that um, you can't reject his message and accept the apostles' message because they were preaching the exact same thing. But it's and this is also important for those today who reject Paul, which is you know becoming it's a it's a it started as sort of a Muslim thing, but it's definitely gaining steam in, in lots of different sort of circles. But what they don't realize is, and sometimes I refer to it as Paulianity. I did a short series of podcasts called Paulianity, excuse me, Paulianity debunked on it. Um, but um, what they don't realize is that if you're going to throw Paul's writings out then you also have to reject Peter's writings because Peter refers to Paul's writings as Scripture in 2 Peter 3, verse 16, which means that you then have to throw out Peter's letters, uh, not, not just Peter's letters, but also the book of Mark because John Mark was the known amanuensis or personal uh, professional scribe of Peter, among other people. But uh, So, so that, um, the, that gospel, the gospel of Mark, is most likely Peter's, which came to be just known as Mark. In addition, one must throw out the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts because both uh, were written by Luke, who clearly accepted Paul as an apostle. So this particular heresy, in is, if you reject Paul, uh, you basically have to throw away almost all of the Bible, including um, two of the Gospels, two of the four Gospels. So it's, it's obviously a tactic of Satan to take the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God, Ephesians six seventeen, from the hands of the Christian. Mike? Interesting stuff. Uh, interesting stuff. Uh, let's see, verse 7. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel of, to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised. All right, so Paul is referring back to his meeting here, as mentioned in Acts 9, with the risen Lord. Uh, now, we looked at this a, 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 a little more in depth last time, uh, but the gospel to the uncircumcised was, entrust, of course, entrusted to Paul, just as the gospel to the circumcised was entrusted to the apostles. It's interesting no, to note, isn't it, that Paul seems to be the one who's really carrying out the Great Commission here, which was – it was pretty emphatic. It was, go to the whole world and tell them about me, uh, whereas the apostles – uh, it, it appears the other apostles kind of like stayed around Jerusalem some and didn't really go to other pieces uh, and didn't really leave the general area of Judea all that much uh, until about 70 AD when Jerusalem got destroyed. And then they went everywhere. 